So we heard the first scripture reading, which came from the gospel according to Luke. The familiar words that describe the shepherd's visit to Mary and Joseph to see the infant child, who then Mary and Joseph take to the temple and have the child named Jesus. What's interesting is that Paul, when he wrote to the early churches, was actually writing at a time earlier than the Gospels. Yet Paul himself says very little about the birth of Jesus. But there is one point in a conversation with the church in Galatia where Paul shares a summary of the Christmas story. And so we'll hear that now from Galatians chapter 4, the first seven verses. Paul is talking about our relationship with God, how we are children and heirs of God's promise. And in that telling, he retells the Christmas story. Listen for God's word. Paul says, My point is this. Heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. And so with us, while we were minors... We were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of God's son into our hearts, saying, Abba, Father, So you are no longer a slave, but now a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. May God bless the reading and the hearing of God's word that it will guide us with the Christmas good news now and always. Amen. Once upon a time, long, long ago, St. Peter convened a special meeting in heaven. It was a gathering of the angel cadets, those fresh recruits among the heavenly host who were still earning their wings. It always amused and somewhat annoyed the higher-ranking cherubim that God took pleasure in seeking out the advice of these young cadets. After all, it was this group that had chosen the size of the avocado pit who had thought it made sense for the pirates to trade away Jared Cole, Andrew McCutcheon, and now Joshua Bell, and who kept recommending pass plays for the Steelers when it was fourth and one at the goal line. So let's just say that the cadets' skills of discernment were suspect at best. But when all the angel cadets had gathered together, St. Peter informed them that they were now a special incarnation committee. God had decided to descend to earth, and God wished to hear their opinions as to what form God should assume for this historic event. Now, this was a very big assignment, and for a while, no one spoke as the cadets nervously nibbled on checks mix. But finally, Angela, the most organized member of the group, spoke up. She said, look, let's list off some of the options. So what are the main forms of life on earth? Well, like a scientific catechism memorized for school, the cadets answered in unison, well, there are plants, animals, and minerals. And after that, the suggestion started. One cadet said, well, maybe God should take the form of a great mountain, a sacred place on earth of of strength that all the nations could see. Or maybe God should become incarnate as a mighty tree, a towering redwood, or a wide-branched oak. Maybe God should come to earth as an animal that that would inspire, like, like a lion, or a soaring eagle, or a blue whale. But Angela interrupted, no, 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 you've got to be more creative. Think outside the box. God's incarnation has to reflect God's eternal character and yet be in a form that's immediately understood by people the world over. So what are some other suggestions? Well, after a pause, one one cadet said, well, what about air? 
Air is necessary for life, and it can be found everywhere on earth. And God is spirit. So maybe God's return to earth could be like the time of earth's creation when the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters and called forth order out of the void and chaos. No, said another cadet, air is too vague and intangible. I propose water because it too is necessary for all life and it can be found in lots of places. The rain from the clouds, the waves on ocean shores, the ice on the tundra, the streams that ripple across the land. A third cadet interrupted again and said, No, water, well, that's too fragile and fickle. It evaporates when you need it most. It floods when you need it the least. I vote for bread. Bread is a symbol for all life-sustaining foods. It feeds and it nourishes, yet it comes out of the rich and generous bounty of God's good earth. Now Melvin, an angel cadet third class, perked up when the subject shifted to food, and he said, I vote for chocolate since that's the real food of life. But the other cadets quickly shushed him and told Melvin to get serious. Several other suggestions were made. What about light? Light chases away shadows and fears. It brings new energy and it lifts spirits. Or what about a poem? Human beings rely on language. And since God's main desire is to communicate with them, why not choose something that could be spoken and then translated into all the languages? Or better yet, what about music, a song? Music communicates sometimes even better than words. It can be done as a solo piece or as an ensemble, and it can express the entire range of human emotions. But a more somber cadet interrupted and said, Look, there's a lot of pain and suffering on earth. What about having God become incarnate as teardrops? Because then in moments of loss and death, God would always be near at hand whenever anyone is mourning or feeling heavy of heart. But someone else said, there's also a lot of joy on earth, so that fact can't be relegated to the margins and neglected in God's decision. Now Melvin, daring to speak up again despite having a mouth full of pretzels, he said, well, my favorite sound is the music of children's laughter. God should choose that. Well, at that very moment, St. Peter cocked his head to one side, attentive to some inner voice speaking to him. And then Peter smiled and said, Melvin, you'll be pleased to know that God actually agrees with you. And that's why God has chosen to become incarnate on earth in the form of a child. The most universal of all human experiences is that of birth itself. And the most common of all realities is to live out a human life of flesh and blood. So God has decided to become incarnate in the form of a child that humans may recognize and clearly understand in what they see now the fullness of God's own being. Now, of course... No major decision, whether made by a church committee or somewhere in the chambers of heaven, ever happens without some dissent or questioning. So as soon as Peter made his announcement, all the cadets' hands went up in the air, and they wanted to know, well, when and where and how will this incarnation happen? St. Peter had them lower their hands as he patiently explained some more to them. So when will this occur? Well, while we exist beyond time, the world exists and comes to be through the medium of time. So this incarnation needs to happen when human beings are developed enough to remember and to write down the experience. But it shouldn't happen so late in human history when their false pride in Google technology somehow convinces them that they already know everything in the world. Let's just say the incarnation will happen at the right time, in the fullness of time. And where will it happen? 
Well, it needs to be somewhere near to the place where human consciousness and civilization first evolved. So a good spot is the land bridge between the great continent to the south and the mountainous lands to the north. The child would be born as a person of color to a family living outside the margins of power. And his story will be told now as part of the story of all the nations, of every people, and of every land. Now I know that some will try to claim this child as their own, drawing this child in their own likeness and insisting that God's power and grace falls most generously on their particular tribe. But no racial bias or prejudice can last long wherever this child is truly worshipped and honored and adored. My dear cadets, the decision about this incarnation has been made with a lot of thought and planning. By being incarnate as a human child, then the whole earthly cycle of birth, life, and death will now shown to be holy at every stage of its unfolding. And by being incarnate in a particular human being, God will be grounded in a place and time just like humans. And that will keep God from simply being some abstract idea that philosophers and theologians think about. Now this incarnation will involve a child of one specific gender. But gender really only is significant for biological procreation who that child is, and how that child embodies love for others is something, well, as you know, goes far beyond gender. So hopefully through this child, humans will realize at last that love is love is love is love. And therefore God will be incarnate in a child born to Mary and Joseph. This child will grow and become an adult, a teacher, a rabbi, a friend, a healer, a savior. This child, born of a woman, will be born under the law in order to redeem all people from oppression and injustice. Will adopting the form of a human being so that all humans may themselves be adopted as children of God and heirs of God's love. And with that, the special meeting concluded. Now granted, the official minutes of the Incarnation Committee don't contain all the nuance of the discussion, but that actually makes perfect sense. The Incarnation of God in Jesus Christ is a mystery that can be explored for a lifetime and yet never be fully exhausted. And as befits the wonder of God's inclusive nature, it's worth noting that actually almost all of the suggestions by the angel cadets were honored in God's final decision. In the fullness of time, God came to us as a child, Jesus the Christ. Yet also God came to us as a living earthly being made of the elements of the world. God came to us as a spirit, the wind and the breath of life, ever active since creation's glory. God came to us as the light of the world and the darkness cannot overcome it. God came to us as the living water that refreshes, heals, and renews. God came to us as the bread of life that feeds every hungry soul. God came to us as tears and joy and music and laughter, especially the laughter of children and families and adults the world over. God came to us as love, promising never to leave or to forsake us. And in heaven as on earth, there was and there still is great rejoicing. Thanks be to God. Amen.